Okay, so good morning everybody to this talk on memory tracing, which is a bit loosely speaking about adding a time component to memory forensics. Um, this is joint work with David Goulash and Dominic Fischer. The talk today will be given by uh, Dominic and myself. So, we first like to introduce the idea of what memory tracing actually is. And to this, to this end, we, we have a look at this um, picture here down below. What you see there is some executable, oh, which is on disk. Then it is run. It is in memory and keeps running there. While it's running in memory, it will, of course, its memory will change. Like there's data that will be modified or created. And sometimes even code will be modified. If you have like um, obfuscated code, then sometimes code changes. So this is essentially shown by the colors you see here. So the colors mean that the memory image of this process is changing. Now the idea of memory tracing is actually quite simple. What you see here are these um, red bars, and each of these red bars stands for a memory dump. And each time you see a red bar, um, we write the entire process memory to disk. And since you see many red bars here, you see we do that with a relatively high frequency. Like, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 times per second. Um, then all these data, all these memory dumps or snapshots, as we call them as well, are written to disk, which yields a huge amount of data. And that data is then analyzed offline to understand what this executable here is doing. Right? So it's kind of a reverse engineering technique uh, that we have um, come up with. Great. So you per probably heard of traditional memory forensics. I mean, what you see here, we take memory snapshots, so it's kind of a memory technique. Um, there are traditional techniques which are very popular. You certainly heard about volatility and other tools which are um, widely used to, to find malware in memory. It's very good to, to, um, to find rootkits. And um, it's widely used, yeah. The idea there is similar to ours, but it looks a bit simpler. Essentially, there you only take one snapshot and analyze it afterwards. Um, two concepts look similar, but actually they're not, they're quite different. Because in traditional memory forensics, you take snapshots of the whole physical memory, which means um, kernel memory as well as process memory. In memory tracing, we're focusing on processes. We only take snapshots of process memory. So the focus is different. As a consequence, in traditional memory forensics, um, you get lots of information about system state, like processes that are running, um, network connections that are open, etc., etc., etc. We get information about code and data over time, much less about system state. And also, the application areas of the two approaches are different. Um, the goal of traditional memory forensics is, as I said, finding malware in memory and also bit reverse engineering, whereas our technique is essentially about reverse engineering. So in summary, these are two techniques and they're not meant to compete. They're much more uh, complementary. Okay, so <clears throat> the next question would be, why is it probably a good idea to do this memory tracing? What's the value there? And I'd like to give you some intuition now. We'll see much more details later on during the talk, of course. So the intuition is, the first intuition is, we get so much data that must be something good in there for reverse engineering, for finding interesting data structures to um, disassemble data, code, etc. So that's the gut feeling. Lots of, lots of information must be useful. But it can be also be a bit more precise, actually. Um, there's lots of data and code in memory which is transient. Transient means it appears in memory and disappears again, right? So for instance, what you could have here, um, you could have a encrypted text in memory. At some moment in time, it will be decrypted. And then the buffer will be zeroed out again and disappears again, right? And this is, of course, the hope in memory tracing. If you take snapshots with high frequency, we will get also transient data, which can be very valuable. Okay? So that's the that's certainly a strength of this technique. It not, does not only apply to data, it also applies to code, because um, you certainly have heard that many obfuscation techniques also encrypt code, decrypt at runtime, etc. Okay. And um, we will later see also in this talk, we can do even more um, 
you will see that we can automate some aspects of, of reverse engineering using these traces. And also, we think which is quite valuable is we can guide an analyst to interesting code and data parts by automatically analyzing certain aspects. We can say, look here, here's interesting code, look at this in more detail. Okay. <clears throat> this was the basic idea. So here we have a brief, more of a system view. How does such a system look like? Um, it's much like any other uh, dynamic analysis system, like uh, malware sandboxes. The idea is as follows. You have here an analysis machine, which contains um, a memory acquisition module, which is a kernel component. Then you take a malware or, or any, any other executable you, you want to analyze. You bring it on the machine and execute it, right? And you keep it running for, I don't know, four, five, six, seven minutes. And during execution, it will um, collect all these memory data, these memory snapshots, right into disk. We also collect some metadata. We're going to talk about that a bit later. And then the analyst, with some appropriate tools, scripts, tools, whatever, will analyze this data to understand what the malware is doing. So the whole system is about two components, actually. One is this acquisition here, and the other is analysis tools there. And um, this pretty much gives the structure for this talk as well. Um, we're first going to talk about memory acquisition, how it's done, some basic ideas. Then we're going to go over to the analysis tools, how they work or what they do. And we're going to have a case study on analyzing, uh, analyzing uh, Zeus, uh, the banking Trojan, using our tools. This will be a fairly uh, long demo, actually. <coughs> OK, some um, more words about acquisition. So what do we actually track? Which process do we track? Um, we don't monitor all of them, only certain processes. And actually, we track processes which get started after the acquisition engine has started. So any new process will be tracked. And also processes that get an injection from a tracked process. You see that in the picture here below. So assume here um, our acquisition module is running. Then the malware.exe process was started later on, and thus it's tracked. It's read. Same for dropper.exe, also tracked. And then foo.exe will receive a memory injection from one of these processes and is therefore also tracked. Um, the process bar.exe probably got started before we started the acquisition. It's not being tracked. Okay. <coughs> so this is the processes you're tracking. The next question is when do we write those snapshots to disks? Um, to this end, we have triggers. Each time the trigger fires, the process is dumped. And the triggers currently are a set of system calls. Um, which can be configured in a file. And each time a tracked process calls one of these system calls, its, pro its memory is dumped to disk. Right? Um, how is it done? Um, just very quickly, essentially the acquisition engine is a kernel component which um, will intercept system calls and see if it comes from process which is tracked and, and um, whether it's a system call that, that triggers. And if so, it will write a scanned memory and write it to disk. Uh, the whole system currently is implemented for Windows um, XP. Okay. <coughs> I mentioned that we also record metadata, not just these memory traces, although the memory traces are kind of a new concept here. But we need metadata for different reasons. So metadata can be like system calls. We, we really... Um, record all system calls, also those that don't fire our snapshotting engine. We also record some events like process start and exit, image loads, injections, etc., etc. And the reason, I can give you intuition why that's important. So assume um, you have a process that has some plain text in memory, encrypts that plain text, and writes the encrypted ciphertext to disk, right? Now you want to search in all those memory snapshots, these memory traces, you want to search for the plain text because that's interesting, of course. So one search strategy would be, of course, to do some entropy analysis, which is a, it's a good idea, which will help. But you're, you're going to get probably lots of hits. Okay, You see lots of snapshots in memory regions with high entropy. Now to be um, able to refine your search, it would be good to know when actually uh, files are written to disk. For that, um, recording system calls 
all the system calls is quite useful because then you only have to search right before a write operation, right? Which, which makes a search much more efficient and sometimes only uh, feasible, actually. Okay, <coughs> here some more details about the triggering. That's um, very simple. This is the configuration file we have used for um, analyzing Zeus. Um, we have actually two kinds of triggers, before and after triggers. So we see here, for instance, the, the system call anti-create-key is a trigger, and it's a before trigger. That means when it's called, before its code is executed, we take a snapshot. And an after trigger here for anti-allocate virtual memory um, will fire when the system call returns from its execu execution. Okay? Sometimes it's good to have memory before the call executes, sometimes afterwards. That's the idea. The choice of triggers is crucial, of course. If you have too few triggers, you won't get enough snapshots and you will miss probably the interesting information you're looking for, right? Um, you also have to choose not just too few, you also have to choose the right ones. Um, the, probably the, the naive um, idea here would be, of course, to trigger everything, so we get everything. But that's not possible for performance reasons. If you would trigger for all system calls, then the system will die down. So you have to find a good mix, not too few, not too many, and the right ones, and that's be the playing around. Okay. <coughs> um, some properties about this acquisition component, uh, we like to point out it's really stable. It's not just um, some research hack that works like every other day. Uh, we've tested it with many thousand samples, mass testing, and we can really say it works with really um, high reliability. Um, we also looked briefly if it's stealthy, it uh, means um, whether it's detected by malware. I mean, some malware detects um, such components and stops working. We had some samples which were packed with Armadillo, Temida, etc., which are popular packers or, or anti-analysis kits. And it looks like everything is running fine, so we have no problem there currently. This doesn't mean, of course, that the component is not detectable. It will have a performance... Um, it will lead to performance overhead, and if you do a timing attack, you, you measure how long operations take, you will find out that it's, uh, you're being tracked. But that's the same problem for all these dyna dynamic um, analysis uh, systems. A few words about performance. I must say we are pretty happy with performance. Performance is, although, uh, although com performance is complex to understand, there are many parameters that, um, that guide the performance. So of course, um, one is the triggers, how many triggers you have. If you have very few triggers, like two or three, uh, we can even work interactively with the machine. So we managed to load Internet Explorer, which is a heavy process, and play around uh, with it. Of course, it's a bit slowed down, but it works. If you have lots of triggers, like in the slide before, the system will slow down. It's less interactive or almost non-interactive, but you still get the data we want to have. So in any case, we've used this tool. It worked. Maybe very briefly on challenges, why it's hard to implement this. Um, the implementation was actually done by David, who is not here today. He's the kernel guru. But the key um, challenge is, is I.O. bottleneck. So you can read memory much faster than you can write a disk, which may clog up the whole process. And that's, of course, a problem. Um, the solution strategy, strategy is on high level, very simple, of course. Um, to avoid those problems, you try to minimize data you write to disk, of course, in the first place. And in second place, um, you try to maximize the output performance. That's what you have done. So to minimize the data, we have done memory deduplication, which means we only write pages that change between snapshots. Well, that's clear. Okay, And that's quite an optimized implementation because speed matters. And for IO, um, for the output thing, David has implemented some um, um, specific output component, which is near to optimal or something like that. Okay, so we move on now to the analysis part, which will be presented by Dominique. Thanks, Andre, for going with us through the process of getting memory trace and traces of <laughs> specific applications. Um, in our al analysis, we got memory traces sized up to one gigabyte of raw data. And what we can do next? How can we find inter interesting code and data 
and gain other insights on behavior, how can we do that? And the first answer to that question is visualization. We thought about that the human eye can detect anom anomalies and patterns in a fast way. So we tried visualization. We came up with essentially two graphs. The first one is shown on this slide here. Um, it shows us nicely the running processes and the running threads within this memory trace. You can see here a vertical line indicating that there is the start of the memory trace and again here is the end where we stop it to record. And those white boxes represent the processes with the process ID and the process title. title. And those process boxes are connected with, arrow, uh, with black arrows if the upper process is a parent process of the lower one. Um, then in those process boxes you have those bars here that are threads. The red threads are injected from other processes or the origin of those threads is from an injected process, uh, from an injected thread. So this thread here got injected from another process and this thread here got started from an injected process. Essentially we see here that Explo Explorer starts our malicious software, the bot, right here. Um, this bot then starts two other processes, one with a randomly name, um, which does some um, thread injections. And then the latter one is the Windows command program here, which got execu executed some time later. Whereas the first graph showed us more, more an overview and helped us to navigate through this detail view, we came up with the memory view, which shows us exactly when we do uh, all recorded snapshots. It's for one process. Here it's just uh, an extract of a whole graph of one process. You see the, sna the snapshots uh, in a chrono chronological order from left to right. And each of those snapshots, the memory regions are um, arranged accordingly to its virtual address from up to down. Um, we used colors to code some attributes of the memory regions. For example, all red rectangles here are executable memory regions. And just to give you an impression how much data this is, here this small rectangle here of an executable memory region is about 100 kilobytes large. If you would convert that binary data into text, it would be about 20 pages long. So you can imagine how many pages this will be if we will convert it in text, and text can be underst understood very faster than binary code. So this is a huge amount of data here. So essentially the last graph showed us that there is a need for a further processing step between the raw data and the visualization. So we came up with um, a few relatively simple, but they have proven to be quite useful scripts. Here is a list of a few of them. We will explain them briefly in the coming slides. And all of those scripts were then used in our SUSE demo. And all of those scripts produces um, results which we can um, visualize then in one of the previously showed graphs. Yeah, so one of the scripts is about finding self-modified code, self-modifying code. So self-modifying code is a um, obfuscation technique, that means code changes its form during execution. Typically, what is seen often is um, code is encrypted before execution, and it started, there's a some small decryption stop, it will decrypt the code, write it to memory, and then jump to that code and execute it. Maybe erase it, erase it again or encrypt it again, depends on how sophisticated the obfuscator is. But it's widely used and um, it's of course important to get that code. I mean, it's meant to be hidden and getting the code is important. And um, that works very well with, with um, memory traces. We have written a relatively simple script that finds self-modifying code uh, with very good quality. We're really able to, to detect all, also small small ranges of self-modifying code as you will see in the 
in the demo. Um, visually, it's very simple. We have here um, an excerpt from the memory view here. And if we find self-modifying code, we just mark it with, by a black bar. So we, you will know, here it is, right? Look at it, export it, etc. So that you will also see later on. So one key idea, of course, is if you have found self-modifying code, you will export that to IDA Pro, the disassembler, to look at it in all details, right? Mm, the next feature I'd like to explain you is the <coughs> module whitelisting, and it does exactly that what you <coughs> would expect from a module whitelistener. It enumerates all loaded modules, like um, Windows DLLs, in a snapshot, and then compares its original um, data with the data in the memory, in the memory trace. So on the left hand side you see an extract of the memory view and basically here could the ma malicious code be everywhere, at least at or in the executable memory region. So you don't know where to look at. And on the right hand side you see now the module whitelister layer enabled in this memory view. And you can see that there is now here all green. That means that this is all um, clean loaded DLLs and you don't need to look at those memory regions. So there exists only one red line now here. And that's one memory region which doesn't belong to one um, DLL. So if we are looking for malicious code, that will be a start to look at. And we see here also now that here is loaded the main executable. So each of one of those is a loaded DLL, here the main. And the module whitelisting helps us also to spot potential malicious modifications of good DLLs. We see here three DLLs, that's also an extract of the memory view. We see three DLLs stacked on top of each other and they are uh, all start here clean, and then at some time all of them got modified here. You see that here. And the lowest one even got modified three times successively. And the nice thing here is also that you see a certain pattern. And we found out in our analysis that, um, for example, in CUs you see that pattern a lot in each process. But we will see that later in the demo. And the next feature is the thread grouping. If I go shortly back to the process view here, you see a lot <coughs> of red threads or injected thread, pot potential, potential malicious threads. And you don't know exactly what they are doing, if they are related to each other, or uh, do they even the same thing. So we came up with the thread grouping feature and it assumes that if a, tr if a thread has the same code and also the same entry point in that code, it is the same thread. And here you see it, see now the layer um, applied to the process view. On the top, it's um, one thread starting a couple of other threads. You don't know exactly what they are doing. And with that layer, you see now exactly that there are only three groups, a yellow, a gray, and a green. And if you want to understand now those threads, you only have to look at one thread per group. And of course, only understand the code underlying the group once. OK. Um. We have a few more features which are easy to explain. So we have a memory matcher that's like um, a bit like a text search in a text editor. You can input some, some um, source region and search for it through all the snapshots. Um, the difference though is that we don't do exact matching because that's not so useful sometimes. We do some kind of fuzzy matching and that turns out to be quite useful. What we do then, we visualize the matching region, so you can say, okay, here I see something, I don't know what it is, please search for that through all the snapshots and mark them black. That will be quite helpful, as you see, very soon. It's actually helpful to uh, find code, code injections or common data used by processes. The other thing is stack backtraces. Um, when you have a system call, we, we look at 
the stack and figure out which parts of memory have been executed. That's also quite useful to see what parts of memory are actually active, or which code is active. That's a bit like with debugging, where you al always know what's active, right? And it's kind of a pseudo debugging, or like, yeah, understanding what code is active. And also a very important feature, although simple one, is the IDA export. So as I said before, it's about finding interesting memory regions. The whole thing is about that. Then once you have found them, you of course need to analyze them manually. But you can, but what you can do then is export that memory region to IDA and have a manual look at it. Okay, <coughs> so we're going to start the Zeus demo. Um, it's actual recording, but I can tell you it's not fake. <laughs> it's just for for time reasons essentially and also because of the resolution of these beamers here um, our tool requires a higher resolution than we have um, here just a few words about Zeus I mean Zeus is I think fairly complex has many functionalities like uh, data stealing injection of HTML um, communication with CC etc in this demo we only um, focus on the installation behavior which is the first thing that happens when you get infected with uh, Zeus. We, we can do more than that, but we don't show everything. But um, yeah. So we start off here with the process view and then zoom in a bit. And what we see here is actually the bot process. That's the, that's the model we had. That's what we want to analyze. We have taken that and run it in our system, right? You see, actually, it got started by explorer.exe, which is quite usual if you double click on it. And we also see that there's some child process started by bot.exe. It will turn out that that's the bot.exe is the dropper, and this here is the droppy. So, what we're going to do now is actually have a bit of closer look at these processes. You see them here in our list. And we switch over now to memory view, right, where we really have a look at the memory trace. And what you see here is the memory trace of um, bot.exe. What you see roughly here, as we said, um, the x axis is time and y is virtual address space. What you see here, if you know these traces a bit, down here are the libraries which are loaded. Up here is the main executable. And here at the beginning, you see some loading is going on. Some libraries are loaded into memory. Here's some, here's some allocations are happening or whatever then it will remain fairly stable over time at this granularity. Okay, we zoom it in a bit. And have a first look. Um, now you also see how our tool works. We have been speaking about these analysis features, and each of them is a visual layer here in this tool. So we can switch on some, some of these features and they will have some visual impact on the picture. So if we look now for whitelisting, then whitelisting will be switched on in the, in the viewer. And that's what we have done, actually. Whitelisting is now switched on. And we see all these regions here are green, which is this is good code, non-good code, nothing to worry about. Uh, the code up here is unknown. And here we see this is unknown code, actually. Oh, but that's not very surprising. That's the actual um, main executable of the bot, which is unknown. What we also see is the whole patching thing we have been talking about. We will scroll to the right in a second. Oh, we have also some meta information here, like size, memory, etc. See that here. So this is still the main image of the bot. We zoom out. Now move to the right, and what you see here, it's really nice. These are these injections. I mean, it's you need a bit more analysis, but it will turn out these are injections into the libraries, so modifications. <laughs> okay. You see also actually what library is being injected to. We can look at the name. Now we want to move on and um, find out what's happening. To this end, we have now turned on self-modifying code detection. I mean, all this is actually pre-computed, right? And what we Mark here now in the in the view is all those black dots correspond to self-modifying code we have found. And there are actually three regions, one small one up here, slightly bigger one down there, and then many very small ones here. We will look at these two in more detail now. <coughs> OK. 
Okay, here again, the detailed view of those regions. So we focus on this one. Uh, we've switched on other layers, but we immediately see here um, we have some basic information about memory. So it's read, it's executable, so that makes ho somehow sense. There's some code that has appeared and it's executable, so that's most likely really code. It's not a false positive. Um, <coughs> we want to now check whether this code is actually running. To this end, we switched on stack backtraces. So this is this purple or pink, whatever it is. Um, lines, they show which, region, which memory regions are really executing. And you very nicely see up here where the main image of the bot has been. We have seen execution here until this, this code here has appeared. Now it's immediately active. So that's kind of true code we see here. This self-modifying code is true code and it's running. The next thing is um, you want to find out where it's coming from. And we have another feature for that. We zoom in a bit. And now we have switched on memory write detection. If we see um, these memory write system calls, we track from where and where to they write. And we see here the red bar has been gotten a bit bigger, you see. That means this memory region is a target of a memory write. Okay? Well, that's very nice. And we also see where it's coming from. It's process 1544. So this memory region was written by process 1544. Let's see what it is. We go back to the process list and see, okay, that was explorer.exe. So what we have seen here essentially is a memory injection from explorer.exe. Now we know where it's coming from, but we don't know what it is, right? So it's time to use our matching feature. That's what we have done now. Um, what you have said, please match this region here and search it all over memory. And you see uh, we have of course matches here, matches up here. What's the, what do we learn from that? Up here we have the main image of the bot and apparently the main image of the bot got copied down here. The funny thing is it came via explorer.exe, so somehow it got there, we don't know yet how, but it's kind of injection, it seems the bot is injecting itself in certain processes. Okay, <coughs> um, I think now we're going to switch over to, yeah, to the drop P process. That's the second process, the child process of bot.exe. We want to have a look at that memory and see if we can gen generate some understanding there. Okay, this is again the overview. We do some whitelisting. I'm not going to go into details. We see similar things like before some patching going on. What we want to focus on rather now is the black parts here. So we see again the image of the bot also appears in the child process. Okay? This is the main module of the child process so it seems to be essentially the same as of the bot. We see strange black dashes here. That's an example of transient code or transient data. That means the image appears and disappears again several times. And what you also see at the right here, that's the same thing as before, the same pattern as for the, as for the bot. We see again, memory region, the image of the bot appearing here. So next you want to look, have a look at, um, at these dashes because they are quite interesting. Why does, why does the image of the bot appear, disappear, appear again, etc. Just wait for a second. Here we're going to use actually another feature. Um, we, uh, what you're going to visualize now is like um, where the heap is located. Okay, here we're zooming now on, on one of those dashes to see more details happening. We switch on the base graph and now we switched on heap location. You see heap is marked in pink. So this memory region is heap, and what we do see is that the, the image of the bot will appear on heap. Okay, that's interesting. It's not executable. Heap is not executable, otherwise it will be red. So the question is, what is it doing on heap? And then we have switched on again um, memory write tracing. 
And what you see here now is a big green bar, which means that memory region is the source of a memory write. You see, this memory region is written to process 15.4.4, and the story, though, is the following one. The image of the process is written to the heap, and then it's injected into that process here, 15.4.4, which, if you remember, is explore.exe. Now, somehow, the story makes sense. The child process of the bot writes the image into explore.exe, which in turn then makes the injection we have seen before into bot.exe. So now we understand the ways this memory is traveling. And we'll see the same in other processes as well, actually. So we see here each of these black um, bars is an injection into a separate process, if you look at each of them. Each time the same pattern. So we see the, the drop P process is, is doing an injection when it's running. Lots of injections, actually. OK, <coughs> this was about analyzing the first self-modifying code region we have seen. So we have a fairly good understanding of what's happening already. Good intuition. We want to have a look, quick look at the second one. It's a very small region. It's a bit different. It is in the middle of executable code. You see that. It's read before, read after. So this seems to be not an injection, but truly self-modifying code. So this is the bot main image, and it has been changed during execution. You see, it's um, the black bar is a very small region. It's just one page, one page uh, large. And what now we're going to see what functions actually, or what code is there. Now what we do is we export just a snapshot before the self-modifying code has appeared, and the snapshot where it has appeared. So these two snapshots here, which we have marked, we export them to, uh, into EDA format for further analysis. That's what's happening now. <coughs> Excuse me. OK, and what we have done here, we haven't loaded them into EDA, but in a tool which is called bindiv. Bindiv is for comparing two binaries, uh, not on a byte level, but on a conceptual level, like on a function and basic block level. And um, what bindiv shows is indeed at the location hex 40a, etc., where the self modifying code was found, we have three functions that appear. And that's what bindiv says. That's very nice. Okay? So there's three functions that apparently have been decrypted at runtime. Um, we can have another look at it here. For one of those functions, again in bindiv, we see before, after. We nicely see here before there was no code or rubbish, and after we see nice clean code which you can analyze now. So, in summary, uh, this self modifying code um, detection has led very directly to three interesting routines. And if you look at them in detail, you will find out they all have to do uh, with installation. So, we have been directly guided to the installation routines of the bot. I think your turn, right? <laughs> so we have now seen some details about the bot and its child process. Some of the aspects we, s we will see here confirmed and we see he'll hear the same thing in another view. And it's much more like an overview now. So if you remember the memory writes with the image, um, Sorry, I need to make a pause. If you remember the memory writes f in each process from the child process, you will see here the exact same thing with the green lines. So the child process is injecting code to each or to many other processes. So this here is the overview of the whole thing. And of course, he does not only write the memory to another process, he also starts new threads in it. And this is shown here. He does three memory writes to each process and then starts immediately a new thread. The green dots are the memory writes and the black dot is the new thread which got started. Of course, you can track down uh, now those red lines and see where this thread is injected to. And So the next thing we'd like to know is what 
what is this code which is injected into other processes. And for that purpose, we enabled the thread group view. And we will see now that there is a ye yellow thread injected into one of those processes. It got the label, it is the thread group M. And here it was virtualbox.exe. And for all of those processes, everywhere is the M thread. And it's just only one thread, except for a few cases. For example, here is uh, the explorer. And in case though this M thread runs in explorer, it will start a couple of other threads. And you see that here on this picture right now. And if it runs in explorer, it will start for example, here two B threads, they are exactly the same, this one here and this one. And they got both uh, another argument. You can see this in the metadata which got displayed. And the other thing is in the Windows security notifier process, it the bot also behaves in another way. Here it starts two new threads, one of the group J and one of the group N. And those threads we also see here in the Explorer process. And what we can assume now is that the Windows Security Notifier contains a subset of the threads of the Explorer. So both of them have has some kind of similar functionalities. Um, yeah, here is also shown one thread of the Explorer does some more injections. And of course we need to know now what is this thread M doing. So for this we go again in the memory view and see one of those threads. And, and if we know what this M thread is doing, we can also also, we know that for every M thread, also in the other processes, of course. So here is again the bot image. It's exactly the same with the memory ma matcher. We have proven that. And it's also executing. Here's the stack backtrace again. And what we now have a look at is the, um, the loaded modules and with the white whitelister. And we see here a lot of modifications. We go now uh, into one of them, or three of them. Um, we see here there is a uh, okay. There is the anti-DLL loaded. Then there is a memory write. Um, there is the address given here, and you see also that. There uh, got written five bytes, five bytes, that's a jump to another location. If we would track down this address, you will come into the bot image. So this is basically a hooking, and it hooks the create thread method of anti-DLL. And you see here the memory write, which is highlighted right now. And one, two snapshots later, um, the whitelister says that this got modified. And you see the exact same thing for, for the other hookings on the right side now. Um, for example, here is the loader load DLL hooked and some other um, system calls or, the, or, or API calls. And again, also for win enet. So we have now seen the, the injections, the patching from one thread, and it appears to be the same in all other processes and we have now understood that the M thread is basically just hooking some calls in the loaded my, uh, in the loaded libraries. And in case it runs in Explorer or in Windows Security Notifier, it starts other threads which are basically there for stealing information or modifying some other things. Okay, so I think we have seen really that now in 20 minutes we could fairly quickly develop some understanding of what's going on, he on here um, in a visual, nice way. Of course, to understand all details, you still have to go into some disassembly and look at the details, that's clear. And no one can automate that. But it was really about guiding the analyst to interesting parts and having a good intuition of what's going on, which will, of course, then help in, in detailed analysis. So we're ready to conclude. Um, I think we have seen some 
we think entirely new technique to to binary analysis. Um, as far as we know, this um, memory tracing is entirely new. We have also seen we can automate some things like finding self-modifying code, etc., and guide the analysts to interesting regions. Um, I must also say that's absolutely open topic. I mean, we just started working on that. Essentially, I think um, there are lots of questions. I mean, is it really useful? I mean, is, can can there be new, better techniques, even more techniques found to, to automate analysis, to gain insights? Entirely possible, I think, but it's unclear. Um, there are also technical questions like um, what would be nice, of course, if we could wake up these snapshots. That would be really nice. If you see, okay, here's a snapshot. That's interesting, probably. And now we could load it like into a debugger or something and start debugging from there. That, but that's technically hard. Um, but that would be, of course, very nice. Um, it would be also nice to also capture kernel memory, not just process memory, because then you have uh, much more information. That would then really be volatility over time. Okay. Great. So, thank you mar very much for your for your attention, and I think we can take some questions. <laughs>